copy and paste of the tags didn't work. Is it working? Oh, look at that. Hey. It's like we just arrived at the table. Okay, yeah. Can you hear us on the on your screen, Megan? You can hear me, you can hear Tim. Hi. Hey. Uh, hopefully people can hear us. Yeah. Um, now I can hear I can hear myself on echo in the other room. Okay, I assume it is working then. Look, you got like a nice microphone and everything. Um, so you are on mute though, I believe. Um, cool. There well, hi everybody. Uh, I'm getting used to a new approach today. Always a new approach. Each one of these. Uh, but this is Jesse Houle, and I'm doing the, the fifth in a series of what we're calling Kitchen Table Chats, and I'm joined by my, my old buddy, Tim Denson, young hey, old, hey. old pal, yeah, and uh, a commissioner, and a musician, and a father, and a bearded human. Um, All those things. Yeah, uh, we're trying this through Tim's, um, Tim's Zoom account, which is fancier than my free one. So hopefully this is working. I'm going to try to share it on a couple pages. Tim, do you want to take a minute to talk about uh, who you are? Sure. I'm uh, Tim Denson. And uh, yeah, uh, right now I am a District 5 uh, Commissioner for athens Clark County Unified Government. And I am also a part-time uh, labor organizer with the United Campus Workers of Georgia. And... Um, also a father, husband, all those things, jack of all trades. Um, and uh, I got involved in a lot of this political work, as you know, Jesse. Um, mm -hmm. We, we kind of did it at the same time. We both kind of uh, fell into it backwards a little bit um, back during the Occupy Movement in 2011. And then, of course, through Athens for Everyone and yada, yada, yada. Here we, here we are. Heck yeah. And I think I've, it, with that uh, extremely concise introduction, I think I've managed to post this to my page as well now. So these times, we're becoming uh, skilled at all sorts of things that I never thought I would spend my time in my life doing. No, it's true. Not, yeah. I did yeah. not think I would be video chatting on Facebook like this. But yeah. Um, all right. So can you see the comments that people might post as questions on your side, Tim? I am uh, pulling, yeah, I'm gonna pull it up. I have a little setup here. I've got a little, my, my little second screen and I'll pull it up here so I can be following along. Okay, um, so I think, yeah, doing this through your page means that I can't see those as far as I can tell. I think if you click on the actual video, I don't know. Hmm. We're not quite as skilled as we thought we were here, I guess. Yeah. Nope. Uh, no, then I'm hearing, then I'm hearing it on delay. So I think I'll just, I'll just let you. So if you can keep an eye on people chatting with us, does that sound good? Uh, yeah. Are you able to do that on your end? I am. Cool. Um, is it already rife with critiques and praise in an, in rapid alternation? I'm hoping it's it's nothing but critiques. We'll see. <laughs> um. um. So I kind of jotted down, you know, this is the fifth one of these that I've done with people. And it's been a mix of um, folks who are doing like community organizing work and folks who are in a more formal role. Um, and, and you're now the second commissioner that I'm doing this with. Um, and what I've gotten from people is a lot of feedback that they appreciate getting to, to know us as people a bit better in addition to our policy stuff. So I thought we could do um, a bit of both of those. And one thing I thought would be fun, of course, you know, you get to decide how much of this stuff you want to get into, but um, we met or what feels like a very long time ago now, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. back before I lived here, and you convinced me to move here. It's true. Um, this was back before I think either of us really thought of ourselves as like especially political. You know, we had opinions, but they weren't yeah. very well developed and they weren't as 
thoroughly acted upon as they are now. So I just a couple of I'm... angry millennials just yeah yeah angry uh, the world. yeah um and and uh, I thought maybe we could just like talk a bit about that you know Barry Fest and whatever. So maybe we could start with your perspective. You know, arriving in Massachusetts to this yeah rural farm. Um, yeah, no, no, it's it. Yeah, so I think it was 2006, right? It was 2006 or 2007? Yeah, I so. um, I think 2006 was the year y'all came because Portable Folk Band was there, right? They were. They were. Yeah, yeah, and that so that was also the first year of the Barrio. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, it was. It was. Yeah. So yeah, so it was 2006, and um, I was uh, playing in a band uh, based out of Athens called Bicycles and Gravel with a different Jesse. Uh, and we um we're on uh it was really our first our first tour as a band and uh the furthest point we were going was barry massachusetts and um just kind of had become friends on myspace with our our mutual friend dylan of course uh who you were in a band with at the time and um you know thank thank goodness for myspace and tom and it kind of connected us and so we uh oh. Yeah, right. Don't forget about Tom. Before you could shirt. get sucked, you had to be mandatory friends with uh, a guy <laughs> in a white t-shirt named Tom. Yeah, everybody should be much more upset about that than that U2 album that was forced in everybody's iTunes accounts. Yeah. Everybody should be much more angry about having to be friends with Tom. Yeah. Um, although he's a fine person, I guess. But so, yes, we ended up in, 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 in Barry, Massachusetts, like halfway through our tour. And um, we we were just blown away. I think it was just like, it was, it was this, it was, it was kismet, I guess. Right. Cause it was like what we showed up into was like exactly like what we were kind of doing down here, at least within our little group. And it was like, Oh, this is like the same thing. Like nobody takes themselves too seriously. Um, but they all are very passionate about their art and music and, and all of their art and music comes from this like very like sincere, genuine place. And like, it was just amazing to like stumble upon this like, you know, whole group of people who we immediately had so much in common with. Um, and so I remember that that night uh, after we all played and we camped out that night and me and Jesse and you and Dylan, and um, there was definitely some other, some other people um, uh, around, but we ended up staying up till I think like, at least four in the morning and and dylan's driveway just uh talking about life and death and fear of death i remember we talked about that one a bunch and just like getting into the, these deep you know these deep things and talking about our music and and talking about neutral milk hotel and you know every i remember like all these things and it was just like oh this is like awesome there's like such a such a, a, a it was we were we were instantly friends i felt like we were like we instantly had a bond um and so yeah and that of course that place was already special to y'all up there in Barry, massachusetts and the whole thing you had but it became kind of a bit of a uh a little second like new england home for me i guess that i had this like uh this connection to all these fantastic people and i still do um who are making so much art and were um and as i've evolved through politics and stuff um all these people have been super supportive i remember coming up there I think the last time I went was when uh, the, the last time I went was like, you know, after, after I lost the mayoral race, but we had done Athens for everyone. Everybody was in Massachusetts. Everybody's like talking to me, like, so tell me like what's Athens for everyone doing right now and stuff, you know, and just like, everybody was so, so engaged. Um, and I mean, that, that, that basement that that festival happens every year in Barry, Massachusetts was, you know, it's where my, my wife, Jenny and I got engaged in, in that, in that basement. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of special memories and, and special uh, love that, and stuff. And so, isn't that video on YouTube somewhere? It is. It is on yeah. video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. can find you proposing to Jenny in uh, Dylan's basement. It's true. It's um, true. And bumbling through it because I thought I was, so, I was like so confident until I actually did it, and then just and like, she's, she's giving you this face, like, "What the hell are you doing? Like, why are you taking so long to get into the song? Like, I thought we talked about this." You yeah, know, it was like the longest down your preambles. The longest intro into a song, I know. But yeah, but yeah, and then, and then, yeah, and then we, uh, you, you were already looking at a place to move to to try to pursue music more and stuff, and you know, and so Jesse, I remember, I think you had it down to, if I remember, Las Vegas or Athens for the two places that you three. were in. There were three. It was Las Vegas, Nevada, Wilmington, North Carolina, That's or right. Athens, Georgia. That's right. And it was uh, so I knew that I wanted to like 
be able to sort of restart, you know, blank canvas sort of thing. And because uh, there's a lot of people in Massachusetts that I love dearly, but I felt like I needed to sort of start to build community around people who shared a vision, we might say, about like how we wanted to spend our time together, you know. And like mm-hmm. you said, you, you and the and the branch collection folks had like this really wonderful blend of like committed to doing things without taking yourselves too seriously. I thought was mm-hmm. really cool. I remember y'all like slinging slam packs, which was just like, well, if you if you pay twenty bucks, you can get or twenty five or whatever it was. You can get one of everything, which is yep. like 30 records that we yep. put out that no one's heard of. Um, yep. But they were all really cool. And so many of them had like really funky packaging and everything. Um, I remember the Florida players that you used to make. Oh. Which, uh, yeah. So Tim is one of a few people in the branch collection who is from Florida. And so then a bunch of them get together and all wrote songs that are only about Florida or things mm-hmm. in Florida. And then recorded them uh, or put copies on cassettes that were uh built into boxes that you could not open and change right. out for anything there are these players that would only play yeah. these cassette tapes of florida songs and there was like i have one that's made out of an old cigar box turned into a clock with a, with a with an old yeah clock you get that one yeah 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 so there's like a lego one and like a seashell oh. one there are all these cool chalkboard one yeah 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 Lost, I lost lots and lots of money and uh, doing everything to do with the branch collection and Just Me Records, my old musical careers, but it was extremely fulfilling. So that's, so I, I win. So yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was like our lives. You know, I, I feel like I, I look back on those times, like planning the music tours, planning the shows. But when we were living together on Clover Street, we would do these scavenger hunts. District like five games. Clover yeah. Street, District five. District five. Clover Shout Street. out to Clover Street. Yeah. And uh, and I remember us just like like organizing these kind of elaborate events, you know, that would be for between like 12 and 50 people or something, you know. Mm-hmm. And um, and I look back on that as like that's how we actually like built the skill set, you know. And like before that, me like helping set up punk shows in high school and stuff like that's how we sort of yeah. began to understand community organizing without thinking of it that way mm-hmm. um and then occupy happened right and i think that's when i know for me like i got explicitly politicized and i remember it was it was um it was interesting like in our household you know you and i kind of became the ones who were at the occupy uh camp or camps you know every day and like yeah. um and the other folks who lived in the house like thought it was a good idea, but were just like, "What the heck is wrong with y'all? Like, why are you like? You yeah, know, you, gotta, you gotta have like a balance in your life." I think they thought we got a little obsessed there for a little while, and yeah, 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 um, yeah. But uh, <laughs> but you know that really shaped I think like where we're at now, where yeah, yeah. without intending to, I think it just resonated again. Like this is a thing that felt meaningful, and we began to kind of understand. Like exactly. I know for me, it was being able to th- there it is yeah um being able to think about these big problems like you know war and climate change and uh wealth inequality and stuff life under capitalism and to not only find better language for articulating some of those problems and gaining a better understanding of some of those systems in play um but finding like real people in the community who i didn't know otherwise who shared an interest in trying to do something and then being able to pretty organically understand like how that matters on the local level and the different mechanisms in place to try to leverage to change things um yeah i mean it, it was massively uh massively important and integral to to my uh political evolution and um yeah and just in general of how to yeah definitely with organizing but also just with how i perceive my society um having really grappling with and understanding like you no know, like uh systemic oppressions um i mean every every night that we spent out there which was what like almost like 100 days or something like that i mean and, that was a lot yeah. yeah i mean every night was was kind of a uh, this beautiful and amazing teaching because which was which was what i loved about it so much was that we weren't like it wasn't like it was like a bunch of us being pupils, like listening to a teacher, right? It was us sitting around in a circle, learning from each other constantly, all of us evolving and building off of things as, as we went. Um, and then groups from around the country stopping in and sharing what they're doing and that stuff. I mean, it was, uh, it, yeah, it was, it was really amazing. And, and I feel very confidently saying that, like, I would not be the person I am now 
and I would not be doing what I'm doing now um, if it wasn't for the, the, the Occupy movement and for, uh, yeah, it, the Occupy movement coming to Athens. So, um, Well, I guess, you know, it's always funny, like, where it's sort of like talking to each other, but it's a bit like we're trying to talk to, to folks who are listening as well. So um, I don't know. Again, if you see people um, chatting in the chat, please, um, you know, share what they're saying or give them a shout out. I, don't, I, I can't see it. So, OK, um, yeah. I mean, uh, right now we, we've got people saying hi. Okay. Uh, Hi, people. Uh, yeah, Commissioner Edwards says Nancy Denson might remember that time differently, um, which is true. I bet I bet she does. Um, and yeah, right now, so that's yeah, yeah. A lot of people just telling us hi and giving us yeah. You know, I wonder if folks such as Nancy uh, have like I, I wonder what she would think about it now. You know, like I feel like with time, we talked about this a lot. This is I remember one of the first wisdoms I got from y'all in the branch collection, but it was about something entirely different, which was looking back on the past with rose tinted glasses. Hmm. You know, and, and your view kind of softens of things and you can understand perspectives of other people better than I think in the moment where it starts to feel like deeply personal or confusing or whatever. Um, you know, over time I've begun to appreciate a lot of folks that I've felt pretty oppositional with. Um, for at least some of what they've had to do, you know, even though I still disagree with them on certain things, like there's still plenty mm -hmm. of Nancy that I think I disagree on. Um, but yeah, I wonder, like, um, I, I think back on like people that I've been very at odds with and mm -hmm. with time, I've been able to like sit with what their perspective might've been a bit more. And I'm like, yeah. oh, like you being angry with me helped me grow. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I understand things I didn't before. Um, and I guess if we get a question from someone, I'd love to hear it. But I, the first one I wanted to ask you, and I can share my thoughts on this too, if you want, but what is something um, since Occupy that you feel you see very differently than you did while Occupy was happening? What was something that I feel very differently now? That you see differently. Like what do you, what's something that you feel like you understand differently than you did when we were doing Occupy? I mean a lot i'm yes, sure you're, yeah you're, you're, so, but, you want to just pick one i guess yeah because you're, you're very right um i would say i would say the biggest thing would be just uh how uh local government work not only how local government works but how um pivotal local government is in the lives of individuals i don't it's not something it's something i, I started learning during that time and really picked up on you know that we as, as individuals, before I got really tied into Occupy and, and, and everything else, um, I, you know, I, I think like a lot of people, like I ignored local government. I, I really, outside of like an article might hit the front page, I look at like, hey, what's going on? I read it for a second, you know, but I really didn't know. I was so focused on uh, presidential politics. I was so focused on uh, maybe what, you know, what my senators were doing and maybe the governor, but these super high level, uh, individuals who are so separated from me in so many different ways um and i thought of them as being the people who really kind of uh were the ones creating our society and and, and they are right i mean they totally are they are extremely powerful people who have a lot of effect but i was so unaware of uh like local government and even like you know state representatives people on that level who are honestly drafting a lot more of the policies and laws and rules that affect my everyday life um, much more. And it, um, it was this, and, but that has really helped me shape how I serve as a local elected official, realizing that I can't expect everybody to know all these things. Like a big, massive part of our job is just informing people about what we do on this local level and what we could do differently and why it's so important for them to be engaged on this level and to pay attention on this level. Um, so it's really, it's really, that's something that's evolved since then and is, I think, continually evolving and has really helped shape me as, as a commissioner. Yeah, I like that you said, like when you talked about informing people, that it was also about informing people about what we could do differently. Like empowering people with the knowledge of how they can oppose you or, or disrupt what's happening and not just like telling folks like this is what's happening and it's the way it is, you know? Um, I've, I've really appreciated that you're among some of the folks on the commission who really seem to have this approach of like, well, there are these different options at play. This is what we're currently doing, you know? Um, 
Yeah. Uh, from my perspective, one thing that stuck out to me when I thought to ask you this question was how wrong I feel I was about a number of things during Occupy. But I remember when Occupy first started out, there was the there was that phrase, you know, the we are the 99%. Mm-hmm. Um, and I remember being one of the people who was arguing for like, well, this is really about the 100%. Mm-hmm. And really mm-hmm. thinking about this as like needing to be this kind of like super unifying um, approach. And since then, I've really uh, grown to see the value of disagreement and the and the value of having oppositional sides in that like it's through those disagreements that I think we grow and I think it's important to yeah. recognize that not everybody can currently have the same position on something and so obviously with with Occupy that was primarily about the the wealth inequality which we've seen only get worse since then um, and you know I think there is something to be said that like I I personally feel like a billionaire cannot share my interests because if they did, they wouldn't be a billionaire anymore. And um, yeah. that's a that's a conversation I like to continue to have with folks. But it's fun to remember that like I used to be staunchly opposed to that idea. I used to think like a billionaire can be my buddy and we can have the same values. And now I'm like, no. I mean, Bill Gates might have a good foundation for malaria, but the the fact that he and his wife have that much wealth is, is in my opinion now like kind of immoral and I think another thing that I think goes even deeper um, is recognizing privilege in a way I didn't before then um, you know when I arrived at Occupy I thought of myself I identified a lot with like my class background and I grew up really broke and I know you did too like that's a big part of how we I think grew close so quickly is that mm-hmm. like we came from really similar backgrounds in a lot of ways. Um, but I don't, and I, and I still go through this, like talking with members of my family, including my father, who has very different ideas about a lot of things, uh, is, uh, that like I had privilege, like part of how it's not the only reason, and there's still a certain amount of luck involved, Mm -hmm. but my luck is not only dictated by my choices. It's also dictated by the context and the context I live in is one where like, there's more leniency for white people Mm -hmm. and communities that are majority white still have more resources even for the people who are super broke and so like growing up in public housing with like brown water and all these like really really disruptive and chaotic things happening in my life i was still less likely to be arrested by police you know um when i was like causing mischief as a teenager or whatever i was still less likely to be suspected by my neighbors just for walking by their door um and I don't think I really began to understand that until during and especially after Occupy. And that was also when I went from being someone who uh, I used to really identify with like the Green Party and socialists and anarchists like Noam Chomsky or whatever. I I didn't use the term anarchist at the time. What was that? Ron Paul. Yeah, and Ron Paul, that's the thing. I was also really on board with libertarianism. And I had a totally different analysis of economics and capitalism at the time where I, I, I really saw like, you know, money as a tool and like a lot of the things that I now also disagree with or at least see very differently. Um, but it's helpful to think back on that time, not only to kind of reminisce about the radical things we were doing that I still think are cool, but to remember that I thought about some things incredibly differently, you know? Um, mm-hmm. No, I, I, I had the same, that was definitely one of the things <laughs> I struggled with. I remember having a conversation, you know, about, uh, you know about like color blindness and stuff around Occupy, but and, and it was it was a, a I, I learned a lot uh, for on on just like you know race dynamics and and the the oppression of uh, you know of, of black individual black Athenians specifically black individuals in general, um, and yeah and definitely going into the privilege, uh, you know I think it's a struggle right it's a struggle for people I think especially for uh, white people who did grow up poor it is it's a struggle sometimes to engage with that and i had the same definitely the same experience that you did um de- dealing with that and having that gr- having to really come to grasp and come to grips with that understanding and uh i think that it's it's probably helped both of us right to be able to talk to other people about that then mm-hmm. um understanding where that resistance comes from and 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 where it's kind of rooted at and try to get around it because like my whole thing is it's like yeah like I was there. I, I grew up that way too. Like it's, it's, it is really rough. Like it, it can suck. Just imagine how much it would suck though. If you had to do that 
plus also be black and have to yeah face that like oppression with like the police or also uh not being able to get a, a loan for a home or for a car and and not and, and being overlooked by employers when you're going for jobs it's like it's even worse like you know and trying to build that solidarity around it and trying to you know pivot it in the other direction so i i um and, I, and that's something i think that I've, I've always appreciated that you you've kind of dealt with that and tried to try to find hear a person out and then like yeah, I hear where you're coming from, and that, that all that, all of that is completely true. And then just like try to pivot in this way that goes more towards a, a solidarity approach and a compassion approach, which I think is, um, you know, that's 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 one of the, the key elements of of organizing, being able to hear a person, and being able to try to communicate to them how they fix into the larger scheme of what's going on in their community or the world. So yeah, um, so I, we, I'm here. Oh, are, are you about to say the same thing? Megan was just telling me you have a couple of questions. Yeah, do you want to share one? Um, so uh, we've got one from uh, Aaron Stacer. Uh, let's see. Uh, she says, so I noticed with both our a 4 e de debates so far, we've had with current commissioners. Um, they've been saying in the past couple of years, there has been a disconnect or a degradation happening between ACC and UGA's communications. Uh, when pressed to explain further, both uh, Commissioner Neesmith and Commissioner Wright sort of declined to do so. What is happening or what has happened? Um, yeah, so, I mean, I'll, you know, let, let we, let's be very honest here. It's like, it's uh, the reason that I think that there, there's so much trepidation about getting around that issue is because that, and I think this is something we should always be throwing out there before we go into this conversation, is that relationship is um, extremely important to this community, massively. Um, the Athens would not be what it is without the University of Georgia, and I believe the University of Georgia would not be what it was, what it is now without a Athens. You know, it's they're 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 tied together completely. Um, their history is bad and good, and uh, the economics definitely are very tied together. And um, so I I think that what happened, I I don't know, I don't actually know if I agree with the whole idea that like just recently um relationship or communications has degraded um i what i think it's really been is that only over the last couple of years um have we really started to dig into that relationship um have we really started to pay attention to it um because i actually don't think i don't see the the i don't see the actual relationship that different about what's happening um but i think we've um you know we're the community is stepping up and forcing the county and definitely the university into uh, into admitting its history and oh yeah white supremacy, admitting its history and how that relationship has led to economic oppression and led to a lot of the economic inequality we have here. And uh, I think at least with the 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 new commission coming on over the last year and a half the county started being more willing to admit to that, uh, to its history and to the fact that things need to be changed and addressed. But I don't think the university has been willing to make those same, uh, to admit those same concessions and to, uh, and to be willing to evolve and be part of that larger community conversation. So I think that's created some tension there. I think that tension has been there. Um, and Honestly, like, so I, I think that a lot of that's on the university. I, and and I've, I've been hopeful when I talk about this. Like, I think it's absolutely impossible for the university to avoid having to eventually dig into um, these serious issues that the university is tied up with. Um, they're going to have to. And I think that the more willing they are to be proactive, uh, the less painful those discussions and the community reaction is going to be. So I, I, I just, I just, I'm very hopeful that the university steps up and starts seeing that they have to be a more active partner, not just with the residents of Athens Clark County who are employees and or students, but with the entire community and how their actions and their existence have definitely helped this town has definitely, but has also had some serious issues where it hurts some communities, especially black communities especially low-income communities here in Athens. And um, I think that, uh, so I don't think it's that the communication has broken down. I think it's tension and that we just have to, it's going to be awkward, right? 
Anytime you so, have like a, a, a an uncle who is kind of being a uh, not wanting to admit with what's going on at the dinner table or something like that when you're having that Thanksgiving dinner, you just got to push on it and eventually that tension breaks. Yeah, so I guess I'm curious. I mean, this co- this question, um, as I've heard it posed by Blake Odd, and then as I've heard uh, Jerry and Allison answer it, seems to be getting at, I, I, I imagine, without being privy to it personally, there's kind of a dialogue or an analysis happening around the idea that something has soured in the relationship between the two institutions. And what I'm hearing from you right now is that it almost sounds like there's a, there's a conversation happening that wasn't before. Yeah. And, and maybe that's creating that tension. And maybe I feel like there's a lot of kind of talking indirectly about what uh, this tension is about. And, and maybe people are trying to say like, well, gee, what happened? You know, in 2018, we elected a bunch of new people and, and now it's soured this relationship. And obviously we don't have the, the two folks I just mentioned uh, here to answer right now. I'd love to hear their, their thoughts if they did want to share, but you know, when given the opportunity to talk about it, they didn't seem to want to say explicitly, they, they were obviously on the commission before you were. So is this all kind of like a roundabout way to say like the presence of you and other newer commissioners has kind of messed up a relationship, a good thing they had going before? Or it like yeah. I, I guess I'm trying to I'm trying to make sense of whether it's like an indirect critique of new commissioners, or if it's a description of kind of a phenomenon. Because you're describing it as a phenomenon, but obviously that's going tracing back to when you first got involved as a commissioner. And so for them, I, I guess I mean I don't know. You're 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 talking with folks on the commission a lot more regularly than I am, right? So are you getting the sense that there's a tension? um between you and other newer newer commissioners with more veteran commissioners and or uga establishment about this um a, a little bit but it's definitely also very indirect like i said and i guess i speak to it as a phenomenon because uh i think i think it definitely part of this it's two things happening right i think that um our community over the last few years definitely going back before i was on the commission and stuff but through um, you know, just a lot of different organized, a lot more organizing has happened here in Athens and it's empowered a lot of our community. And, our, and so I think that a lot of our community members have been pushing that conversation. Um, but up into the last couple of years and that, that, communi- that, and that, 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 that conversation has been pushed on, I think, athens Clark County government and the University of Georgia. And up until the last couple of years, neither one of those entities would respond. So it was very easy for that conversation just to go away because nobody was responding. And I think now that we have uh, at least some of, you know, the ACC commission and in some ways with resolutions and stuff, all of, um, that the county government is responding and take, and that puts pressure on, right, UGA to like have to also respond and to also have to take uh, responsibility for what's going on. And, yeah, I, I and so kind I think, of under- yeah, it's harder for them to ignore now because of that. Okay, yeah, so that kind of matches my take on, as I've heard this conversation begin to happen more out in the open, but still in this weird indirect way. My my take is sort of, there has been a tension for a very long time between these giant institutions in town and people, especially people who are trying to do activism and advocacy. Um, And now, you know, the local government, which is, you know, theoretically, like an extension of the people's will and understanding, is kind of engaging with and, and working with that the community more. And so now there's a tension between institutions with each other that before was like with the institutions kind of unified at odds with the community or parts of the community, right? Or, or at least to say not that, not that talk about that difficult conversation, right? You know, like whenever you have a roommate in your house and there's that thing that you, if y'all both ignore it, your communication or your relationship seems like it's better, but it's really not. Yeah. Right. And then you bring it up, which is, is inevitable. You have to bring it up. And mm-hmm. then it just creates that tension for a while. But mm-hmm. honestly, as I've said, like, I think that in the long run, this is going to be much more helpful, healthy for University of Georgia, along with our entire community and the county government. Yeah, well, as a closing thought, and then we can take that next question, maybe. Okay. Um, this kind of brings you back to, I think, where we were with the Occupy thing, which is that um, I really feel like 
there's an opportunity here to lean into the difficult discussion and from there something better comes out of it for everybody you know i don't think that i personally think that the, the best way forward when there is tension is to have that conversation out in the open you know and try to do it in like a respectful way which is sometimes easier than others or whatever you know like really try to but to really dig into the substance of it you know i i, I very genuinely wish that uh the incumbent commissioners who are in these past couple debates had spoken to it more openly um but i would certainly like to continually sort of invite that dialogue to happen you know i think um one thing i noticed you know i, I moved here from massachusetts as we talked about like 12 years ago and something that's pretty different culturally down here from up there is up there when folks uh are experiencing tension they tend to just say it um more bluntly and down here there's more like a kind of a layered southern politeness approach to things you know yeah. um and i've even seen how that's kind of changed how i interact a bit you know i'm not as blunt as i used to be and in some ways i think that's good because i think i was kind of a jerk sometimes you know <laughs> uh and, I, and I, i'm glad that i'm like not as sarcastic a person as i used to be because that's mm -hmm. this weird own like wall uh wall against being vulnerable and stuff so i appreciate how like moving down here i think is coincided with me becoming like a more vulnerable and open person um and in some ways kinder, but I also think it's, you know, uh, important for us to, to lean into that, those difficult conversations. Um, anyway, uh, Megan just passed me a note. Carol Sundlin says, what experience does Jesse have with government? Ooh. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I, I, uh, I guess I'll just start by saying, um, usually my inclination is to talk about what we can do and like, and where I think we can go. Uh, that's, that tends to be a lot of where I focus my energy until deciding to run for commission, I very deliberately did not ever want to talk about me or my biography in a public sphere. Although, you know, I'd be happy connecting with people in a personal way. I think building personal relationships is really important in the work we do. But mm -hmm. uh, ultimately, my, my philosophy about movement building and even with governance is that it's not really about a person. It's about um, community. It's about kind of like collective will and collective action. Um, so I haven't been real great at uh, building and promoting a resume, uh, but um, I'm learning that I need to to speak to that a bit more. And I guess if you want to to share for Carol some of your experience, and maybe I can your your experience with how you've seen me kind of engage with things, uh, and then I can talk about myself a bit more too. Um, I finally I, I've, I've been. The other thing I've been doing is getting engaged on social media more because of coronavirus. Yeah. Uh, so like I had recognized that like being on social media very frequently felt really unhealthy to me. And it's mm -hmm. actually been kind of tough, like trying to connect with people more, but needing to do so through the internet and phone. Um, so, so I'm leaning into doing that more now and, and recognizing the importance of connecting through social media right now. Uh, is, is also giving me an appreciation for how it might be useful in the future and hopefully I can hold a healthy boundary there. But I've been mm. joining some of these Facebook groups for different neighborhoods you know, nearby, including the, mm. the Tallahassee Forest. And that was my first attempt at trying to describe, okay, well, here's some of what I've done. So, mm. so thanks for inviting me onto that group and uh, it gave yeah. me a little practice on, on talking about that. But um, do you have some thoughts? Yeah, because I, 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 I think you're right. You know, um... Oftentimes, uh, organizing and stuff is not necessarily as people get become as much as aware of it. You're not doing it out in the public as much when you're engaging with with government. But you know, I, I think one of the the big things that I'm not, I guess I is, I know about it. So I assume people don't. But like back during uh, uh, the my mayoral campaign, of course, um, like uh, you and Adam Laszlo were really probably the two like main strategists with me like on that campaign and working through the issues i remember uh having like uh both of y'all and, and and jamie gardner and like lauren blaze like i remember like numerous times like spread out throughout my my house like in different rooms everybody's like digging into like really like tweaking and researching like on on transit policy and like, i mean i mean i still remember that night that we like kind of had this like in and out about like, is our policy going to be fair free transit? Is that what it's going to be? You know, and I remember, I remember that like very clearly. And um, I remember like, uh, like, like Jamie Gardner wasn't there, but like 
Jamie called called on the phone. He's like, no, it has to be fair free. Because it's like, there's some people talking about like, maybe we can just do a quarter. He's like, no, it has to be, that, that's the whole point has to be, no, I remember that. And let's going back and forth and having the whiteboard out there. And, you know, I, I think your experience with that, like digging into like a strategy and, and uh, policy analysis and stuff, um, which, which is definitely like a big part of the job of, of commission, right? We, we, if you, county commissioners here in Athens have no staff, zero staff. So if, 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 if you're going to be a, a, an effective commissioner pushing new ideas and stuff like that, like you have to be researching those things and developing them and plus also advocating for them and um, literally writing the policy and stuff. And so I think that, uh, you know, through the, the mayoral campaign, of course, through like Athens for everyone that you have a lot of experience that working with that, including also with our living wage campaign that back with Athens for everyone. Um, that was something that you were uh, pivotally involved in the push to get um, uh, all all work all ACC workers uh, to pay a, a, a living wage, uh, which we worked with Economic Justice Coalition on. And so, um, yeah, I think that like like kind of like you said, like while maybe you you weren't the uh, people didn't see it as much, but you were behind the scenes actually helping to craft policy and figure out the best ways to present it to the public and present it to to fellow commissioners, which is a big part, right? 10, 10 commissioners on, on a body. One of the big things you have to be good at is like being able to present these things in a way that you can get a majority of your fellow commissioners on board to, to, to get behind on something. Um, so I think that's been, uh, and also uh, the same thing, like on uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> the last time, <laughs> the last time I saw, saw you in a suit was uh, for us to go uh, lobbying at the Capitol. And it was one of those things. It's like, no, we don't have to wear a suit, but like, Honestly, like these people are like, it's terrible, but some of these people dismiss you outright if you walk in and aren't dressed in a way that they think is like at least somewhat acceptable. So I remember like you, you throwing on a suit, doing it for the cause, putting, putting on a tie. Yeah, I think that's the last uh, time I've worn a suit actually. Um, if we and, did it again, I, 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 maybe I'd put on a skirt instead, like a very yeah. formal, yeah. yeah. You know? but, but like it, it was, it was a, uh, you know, and that was the go off and the, the fight for Medicaid expansion and um and for a lot of other important uh important um also get like to get uh, our gerrymandering get again independent redistricting commission so uh i think that like on the state level and the county level and local government level you have a lot of experience and that's the main levels that you would be working on so well thanks thanks for some of the shout outs yeah it's it's weird to like for, in my mind i think of all these experiences that i've participated with people for the past like 12 years in town as like a shared experience that I've just been a part of. Mm -hmm. um, and it feels kind of gross to take credit, you know, like it feels really gross to be like um, living wages, you know, like we did that and I was a big part because the point was, was actually, I think quite literally that we did that, you know, that like, it, yes, I was relentlessly attending meetings and emailing and calling and meeting one-on-one -on -one with different members of local government or the community, to try to push for that but so were other folks and ultimately the way that we succeeded was by growing the group of people to be involved and sharing that power out right and so i think to me one of this is maybe kind of nuanced i don't know how like well this is going to come out right off on the fly here but like to me there's a cultural norm in uh democratic societies and including ours and including in this town this country um, that you have representatives. And once someone's in that role, they kind of do the work for you. And to some degree, that's what it is about, right? To, to do public service and to dig into things where you're just kind of delegated to be the one to pour over what the best decision is to keep the water treatment plant running effectively and to make sure the solid waste department has the resources they need for everyone to meet their basic needs in a way where government does kind of function invisibly. Um, but the slippery slope that I think we often find ourselves in is then we sort of give off our participation and our power to other people and other people who are doing that work day to day begin to conflate doing some work for other people with doing all the work mm -hmm. for other people. And I think it's really important to keep finding ways to do it with people, which doesn't mean burdening the entire 123,000 people who live in Athens with a directly democratic decision about every little thing on the agenda. Uh, but I think it does uh, take 
continuing to find ways to cultivate the perspective of what's important here, what's a priority, what, what are the big decisions, and then how do we really make that a collective process? Yeah. Um, and, and part of that is proactively reaching out, you know, when we're working on things, when the government's working on things, hopefully I'm there with you in a year to do it, you know. Uh, but then part of it also, I think, is really listening when people show up. You know, it takes like a lot of work to show up in the first place. And, uh, you know, one thing I've seen change in the past couple of years, again, you know, since you and others have gotten elected to the commission and since Kelly moved into the mayorship, is that there is more responsiveness from the local government to advocates and activists who come in with proposals. Um, and I'd really like to see that continue, you know, like people who are leaning into doing the work outside of city hall and outside of formal government positions are essentially like offering their labor for free to try to make the community better. And, you know, as you said, like the, the, the mayor and commission is a legislative body, but unlike most legislative bodies, especially for a city the size of Athens, and certainly like when we think of legislatures in the state and federal level, there's no staff, right? Like the staff is the county government, um, but none of them are dedicated to advancing the platform of issues that you brought forth when you got elected, right? They're only dedicated to that platform to the degree that you can arrive at consensus with the rest of the commission to instruct them to enact it. And I'm glad to see that that's happening more too. Um, but right now, you know, there's tons of issues that are that are not yet consensed upon by the whole mayor and commission, but that people are pushing for. And to include the community in the process of developing these resolutions and these policies, um, I think is not just about informing them of the mechanisms in place, but also about really building in their participation. Um, so I've been excited to see you do that a lot, and I hope that, that more people will. And I guess that's now kind of veered far away from the original question, but I think it speaks to how uh, even as I as I get on the commission, you know, which is, you know, again, where I hope to be, we don't know, but um, uh, there there will probably be more of a tendency to focus on me and my name and my face, and I, and I really look forward to being able to kind of bring that back into like really this is still an us thing though and that us isn't just working with the other nine commissioners and the mayor or the manager and the manager's office and the attorney and the attorney's office and the auditor and the auditor's office it really isn't us that is the whole community of athens yeah, um, yeah. no I, I, so, I, think that's, I think it's true i mean i i the dealing with that, i guess i've like tried to is i i agree it's like awkward whenever you're yeah this whole idea of like a, a you don't want to be like coming like self-importance right because it's not that's not really what it is and so I've, I've tried to like deal with it by thinking um that we're basically tools we're, we're tools of democracy <laughs> I, you I mean, call I mean, yourself a tool <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah yeah um and, uh which makes me want to i gotta get a beverage and i'm gonna cheers to that keep going okay. i'll be right back and and so yeah, so to, to be that we're that we're we're tools to help facilitate that democracy. And um, so anytime that we get those kind of wins, then yeah, we need to definitely be praising and should have been working with along the whole time the, the larger community. Um, and the the, I mean, definitely my the the thing honestly, I I, I loved. I actually have, I missed them. We had to I had to reschedule my last uh, District Five Town Hall that I, that, I, that I hold every month. And we focus on different issues and stuff and such, and it's really a, it really is it's a listening session of like all right here's this issue, the entire district is invited really the entire community whoever wants to show up but it's focused on district five residents and they come out and talk about the issue and they give me ideas and they put questions and we have staff there so they can push on staff they get they get more information, um, and I think that while it is definitely more work to do it that way, and this is something I truly believe and I think is, is shown to be true, and it's, it's something I think that ACC staff is seeing more now also, is that if you do that work on the front end, that work of engaging people and actually having them be a part of the process, in the long run, you actually kind of end up saving time and work because then when you have, when you are presenting that final product, if it has truly been not only vetted by the public, but actually created by the public, that end product is going to be something closer to what the public actually wanted in the first place and needed in the first place. There's going to be less resistance to it. And there's going to be uh, less like having to rework things at the back end because you hadn't listened to people. You know, you're going to have less lines at the podium of people being ticked off because they didn't know what was going on. Um, 
And I've been really happy to see like our county manager's office and staff really, maybe it took a little bit of time for it. They believe that, but they've definitely now seen it. Um, and I mean, uh, county manager, uh, Blaine Williams has come to numerous of my town halls. And afterwards he's told me, he's like, these, I mean, this is really helpful. This is helpful for staff. This is helpful for me. Um, and we're building a better district and a better, you know, county and stuff by, by doing it that way. Hopefully it can rub off higher up, you know, higher levels. Heck yeah. Well, and hopefully we get more of us in there who really want to do the town halls thing, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you know, part of this is, you know, I am running for office, right. And like, um, been pretty fundamentally committed to this idea of public meetings as we've tried to host them over the years in various organizations we've been a part of, but it's definitely something I'm strongly committed to. And I definitely think is a clear thing that's different between myself and Jerry is that, you know, he's never had a town hall. Um, his, his website wasn't even updated and his list, his mailing list wasn't even operating for the past seven years until this electoral did. So, you know, hopefully, regardless of the electoral outcome, hopefully we'll start to see um, public meetings happening in district six. I'd love to think that even if, he wins, he'll be willing to start having them. Maybe I can help him organize them, but um, I'm, I'm definitely committed to making them happen um, once I hopefully am on the commission and uh, maybe we can team up on some. I know we have a question from Amy Andrews. Yes. It's for you. Um, so I think, I, think, I think this can be for both of us. I'll answer, but okay. I think it's a great question for you too. And, and right before you ask it, I wanna say cheers to being tools. You know, uh, I don't know what you're drinking, but I have a, a terrapin glass. There you go. That I think you might have given me, but I don't remember. And a beer from Creature Comforts that I know you gave me because I've Cocoa been doing Bunny. grocery yep. runs for people, especially <laughs> folks who it's not safe really for them to leave their home because of their immune system or whatever. And uh, and I picked you up some of that swagger. Yeah. Bath. If anybody wants to know how Tim looks so swank. It's uh, because he uses Old Spice Swagger. That's it. Anyway, I've been saving this beer for our kitchen table chat. So I, so cheers to you, my friend, with this cheers. cocoa bunny. Um, and yeah, Amy Andrews asks you, Tim, but then you know you can spin it back on me however you want. Mm -hmm. Since you've been on the commission, do you have a different point of view or not about activism? Uh, I.e., activists are often criticized for not having realistic expectations or understanding the limitations of what local government can do. Um, thank you for that question, Amy. That is a very good question. Um, and, uh, the answer is yes, I do have different views. Um, right now I, I have a, an, an, a very intimate knowledge now of both sides of, of that rail. Um, and I think so definitely, uh, I, I am more aware of, uh, mistakes that I made maybe and um, maybe tactics that could have been uh, better done. I definitely do. Uh, and, um, but I think that what's most helpful to me is having the awareness of what real, I mean, really deep awareness of what it's like to be on the other side there, how difficult that is and how much that anybody who drives the city hall, prepares a statement, does research on that statement, stands up there and speaks to us in, in an intimidating forum, um, how much respect that individual should have, how important it is that of the individuals who do that, that they, those people, government's not going to be better if it's not challenged, right? Even good government, it has to be pushed. And so I am um, always extremely appreciative, even a few times, even the times where I don't agree with what the person's saying, even the couple of times where people have called me out by name uh, from that podium because they're not happy with something I've done. Um, I, 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 I have amazing respect for that process and for that podium. And, and in some ways I, I miss, I miss that podium. Um, I, I still remember the very first time back, back when we were doing Occupy and it was during the urban camping law and and Russell Edwards brought this up too, asking a little bit about the tie-in between Occupy and the downtown Walmart and, and all of that stuff, how it intertwined. And that's also how I kind of really uh, sparked my relationship with uh, Russell Edwards and with Melissa Link also. Um, and uh, I remember the very first time there was the urban camping law, a law that was going to outlaw, uh, put a curfew in place so nobody could be on public property, including city hall or parks after sundown. 
Um, and we knew this was going to have a massive uh, impact on homeless individuals, even though that law was very much, I still feel, targeted at Occupy the Occupy Athens group um, and the tactics that we we're using. But I remember the first time standing up and, and I wrote something out. And I mean, I, I was shaking. My hands were literally shaking. My, my, uh, my heart was beating so fast. My breathing was so fast. It was hard for me to catch my breath as I was even speaking to this thing. I was so scared. I was so intimidated. Um, and so I, I, um, that's always in the back of my mind whenever, I, whenever I'm doing my work, and especially during those meetings. And so I tried to always, at the end of the meeting, uh, thank those people who do that stuff. But even outside of City Hall, you know, the, the, the activism that's going, the organizing that's going on, um, that's, it's, it's integral. And while tactics might be screwed up sometimes and not work and might maybe misguided, um, the intent behind it and the fact that it's happening is so important. Um, and so I always try to, even whenever I get frustrated, I'm like, oh, geez, that's the now, but now the what I know now, that's a terrible way to go about doing things. That's 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 not good activism. Um, I always try to go about think about very compassionate ways, but 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 at least they're doing it, and they can get better, and they're going to get more refined. And they're going to become a better activist, and by those people becoming better activists, we're going to build a better community. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll take an an imperfect activist any day over a perfect politician. So. So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll throw it around to, to, to you, Jesse, because I think, I mean, this question completely speaks. I think you have a, a very similar uh, background uh, to me. So um, yeah, in the same way, like if, uh, and during this process and you being, pre getting prepared, uh, you know, for, to, for this race, for, the, for that seat um, and think, and, and having to put yourself in that place, right? To think about these things differently. Like when you're creating your platform and answering how you would do these things and people ask you questions, uh, what what have what have you learned, um, good and bad, from your activism background that's helped you for to answer those questions to create that platform and prepare? Yeah, uh, what have I learned? So I, hmm. well, to be honest, like this to me feels like an extension of everything I've been doing. Like it doesn't feel too much like there's a major threshold you know there's there's sort of time markers to point to of when i decided which was like i i, I had, had thought for the past few years i really felt someone in district six needed to run in this race as a progressive candidate um and as i talked to more and more people who i thought might and, the, and their answers were no or probably not they didn't seem enthused i started to think more about how well maybe that silly idea that i should I should start taking it seriously. Um, and so I had to talk with my housemates about it. So I can point to like when I decided I was actually going to do it, which was after I left town on a music tour, I came back and I took that time to, to really decide. And talking with my friend Dylan Clark, the, uh, the, the co founder of Barry Fest, the main force behind Barry Fest is Family Farm that was on where we first met, uh, who, who ran for Select Man in uh, the small town of Barrie recently um, and kind of advancing the Bernie Sanders platform on the very, very local and rural level. Um, it's really a conversation with him that I think nudged me into doing this because I realized that it's not A, that big of a deal. There's a lyric I wrote in a song a while ago. It's like, we always think our thing is the most important thing, um, which is maybe weird sounding, but like whatever we're involved in, it's taking up all of our time. It's all of our focus. We're really in it. And like, it feels like that is the most important thing in the world. And it certainly is to us at the time, um, but it's not necessarily going to stay the most important thing to me. Uh, and it's definitely not the most important thing to other people. And it, and it probably ought not be. And so really like the collective human project is kind of engaging these ideas with each other that feel very important to us at the time, while we have very different lived experience informing what is important. Um, and so I think of like that, that's what activism is. And ideally, you know, we go about it in a way that builds solidarity with other people. And that includes lots of listening as well as talking so that our ideas evolve. That includes being open and vulnerable to recognize how we might be wrong or our arguments might be incomplete. And, uh, you know, choosing to run for commission 
uh, has essentially just been a way to further advance all the things I feel like I've been a part of before and taking the same tactic I think we did ever since we had that wild idea during Occupy that someone should run for mayor and who's the most electable person? We think maybe it's you, Tim. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Curse of the name, I had the same last name. Yeah, I had the same last name. I remember that was, a big, that was one of the things that we thought would really work in our favor. Uh, and you were and you were like married and uh, and getting a home and you had a full time job for multiple years. You know there were like things that really set you up to be solid. You know, um, but all along I feel like you and other folks I know who are taking on these more formal roles are doing it more of an extension of just who they are as a person. And who they are as a person is not defined by that role, um, even though that role becomes a huge part of how you spend your time. Um, and we're all this like intersection of identities, right? Like you are a commissioner and a union organizer and a father. And for a long time, like the manager of a bookstore and a big book nerd, you know? <laughs> and uh, and so the same is true for me. And I, so I think I will always be an activist and I will always see kinship with folks who are bringing their ideas to the table. And I really do see like, it's taken a lot of practice, but now more regularly, more constantly, when someone brings an idea to me that I don't like, or that I'm like, ugh, that, that seems stupid to me, or like awful or mean, uh, I, I kind of pause and like sit with it and like, what, like what, what made someone want to say that in earnest? You know, like they have an entire life that added up to them sharing that idea, you know, and it's not necessarily more valid than me. And so, what what government I think can do is bring that conversation into the public forum. Part of why I'm like really glad that work sessions are public and you doing town halls. And I think we need more of these public things. Oh, I guess a flashback to another resume builder is you and I were the, the ones going there, I think with Chris Dowd to at different times trading off, filming all the work sessions, trying to make the local government do yep. it. And then turns out all we needed was Mariah Parker there to actually make it happen. You know, you get yeah. some initiative and it happens. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and uh, sorry, I, I lost my train of thought. Oh, so when people bring any kind of idea, including one I, and maybe especially one I don't agree with, it's an opportunity to have that conversation publicly. I get practice articulating what I think. Um, they get their idea heard. Hopefully more people get to hear it and form their own opinions um, that are informed by our opinions. And then it becomes clearer what the better idea is. And you know, if I actually have the better idea, I can make those arguments in advance why, and you know whether it does or does not convince the person who brought their idea forward, it's at least part of a public discourse that hopefully continues to keep public opinion moving in a way that's something like consensus. But like, ultimately, I'm sorry, this is kind of a meandering answer, but like, I think all this tension is, a, is like a good thing. I think it's, it's, what, mm -hmm. it's what advances our ideas and our understanding. And, and I think that when I'm on the commission, where I hope to be um, with the support of you and many other folks who are really helping uh, trying to make it happen that I can just be like a facilitator of that conversation in a in, tool. A tool. Yeah. I'm really excited to be a tool. And my last name rhymes with it. Cool. The tool. It's like, I used to get, this is a perfect example. I, one of the many ways I was bullied as a child was to be called that. And now I'm openly embracing it. You cool. Know? The tool. That was one of <laughs> yeah. the, was like, Oh man. Right. That'll be the cool. That'll be the slogan. Deborah says, Hey, Jesse, who glad you are running. Thank you so much, Deborah. Thank you, Megan Westbrook, for giving me post-it notes of people's comments that I can't see. Um, Tim, I know we talked about doing an hour. I'm happy to go to like seven if you want, but we can stop real soon if you want. I'd like to at least get to this one more question I was handed. Okay. Um, does that feel good to you? Or sure. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I don't get to hang out with you enough it's generally, true. Uh, true. and especially with shelter in place. So this yeah. is you know kind of just hanging yeah. out anyway, just on camera, which is weird. Yeah. Uh, so Aaron Stacer, uh, who I think asked this question earlier as well, um, asks, how likely is it that we could get participatory budgeting for some things? So this is on my platform, maybe an example of some of the kind of like bigger vision ideas that we often bring forth. Um, mm -hmm. Oh, maybe one last thing for um, Amy's, Amy's question. Um, I think it's really important to have big ideas and big vision to guide our ship. I often use this ship on the sea analogy. Um, and it builds off of a, um, a quote about how, like, what's the purpose of doing things? It's, you know, step by step, you walk toward the horizon, but the horizon keeps moving a step further. So why do anything at all to walk? It's actually a, a, a quote in Spanish. Um, 
And there's another parallel quote from Eduardo Galeano that I really like. That's like one eye on the microscope, one eye on the telescope. Mm -hmm. What can we do now, you know, in, in, in the place that we are, but how does that affect people further down the line and further away? And I think it's important to have like our compass set on a point on the horizon that we know we want to aim for. So even as we're navigating around this or that, you know, landmass or through the storm or whatever our metaphor is, that we know ultimately like where we want to go. And it's not that we expect that we're going to get there. We're not going to reach the horizon, right? We're not going to get to utopia. All of the things in forming a fairly ambitious platform that I have for a local government position are not going to happen in four years, but they're going to guide all the decisions I make. And they're, they're going to indicate where I'm headed and who I want to work with um, to, to make things happen. And so uh, I, I think there's a real value in that because otherwise you're stuck just reacting to what's thrown at you. And that doesn't necessarily leave us in a good position to keep people safe or to tackle the challenges that are really big and really real. But I think at least you and I, Tim, are probably sick of talking about. I'm sick of talking about a 38% poverty rate. Mm -hmm. So if we don't have a vision about how to transform our community to change that, then we're just going to react to the existing systems in place that keep 38% of people below the poverty line and ensure that it's very disproportionately black people who are part of that statistic and keep incarcerating people who don't need to be in jail in the first place right. and keep doing all these other things that aren't very good. Right. Um, so, so one of those ideas that I like a lot is participatory budgeting. It's on my platform. So I guess I'd like to start by throwing that at you. If, if you can give thoughts on what you think about the feasibility of that um, and how we might begin to build that into our local governing processes even though um, you know, the idea of having a fully participatory budget mm -hmm. is probably fairly utopian right now. Yeah, I have a fully one. I don't know if I can say it's utopian because you, you kind of brought it up that like the idea of like burdening everyday people with like what is some of the rudimentary work of governing. Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, a, a large, very large chunk of our budget is that kind of thing is how you know is funding our uh stormwater infrastructure it's uh funding the um literally just like central services right of like keeping the lights on in multiple businesses and and making sure they're being painted on a on the right uh, amount of time so that like the that everything is staying in an in orderly fashion and so a lot of that a lot of that work is very rudimentary stuff that i don't think would serve uh the public well of having to decide how often a building is being painted and how many people it takes to do so and what is the proper amount that you should pay for a bucket of paint and stuff you know um i think that stuff is great to be left to staff but i definitely think that we should have um uh, a chunk set aside um as they've done in uh, new york city and a lot of other places um new york is one of the models that i like a lot because it's so interactive and people can anybody can submit a proposal and then they can pull it up online on a map and see where all the different proposals, where they would affect. So they can try to have an idea of how, um, you know, how equitable the, the proposals are and stuff like that. So and I'd love to see if, us. If I can jump in for a quick second, another good example is in New England, where I'm from, a process that I was only kind of vaguely familiar with growing up. I got to learn more about from Dylan when I was visiting is that they have their, their town meetings like once a year. And they actually discuss budget proposals in the town meetings. And then the town kind of gathers for a vote once a year on some bigger things. So yeah, it's, it's yeah. similar to the SPLOST process here, mm -hmm. um, but happens more immediately in real space. There's more of a forum for debate. Um, and, they're, and they're not making decisions about things that are as limited in, in scope and possibility as SPLOST projects are. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so that's... And that's true. Like our closest thing to it is probably is the, the, the SPLOST and T-SPLOST process. Um, what I would like to see done, uh, is, and what I advocated for is, uh, the, the, uh, prosperity package to be done through, uh, participatory budgeting where, uh, community groups and individuals could submit proposals and those proposals would be, um, maybe whittled down to the best 20 or so by, again, a citizen committee, and then put on a ballot of some sort in which they'd actually be voted on. Um, and I, I still completely support that process. I support extending the prosperity package, making it an annual investment that we do. And I would love to have uh, that, that package or at least a, uh, a majority of it um, chosen through um, participatory budgeting. Now, something we do need to be careful about when we talk about this, because again, it's one of those things that can be like, the idea is fantastic, 
but already our our elections and right our local government is already a lot easier to interact with for people who have a lot of privilege people who lack privilege and have lack access are often left out of those conversations and we have to make sure that if we're doing participatory budgeting it does not fall to those same kind of faults which is very possible so i think we'd have to take a lot of explicit steps to make sure that especially if we're talking about like the prosperity package, which is supposed to be helping people who maybe are, are facing struggles, are able to engage and choose those things. So I think it would be a, uh, it's, a, it's, a it's a challenge worth taking on, but it will be a challenge for us to get it right. But I think let's start doing it immediately. And then five years from now, we'll, we'll have a really good model that, we, that we're working with. Yeah, I love, you know, this kind of touches upon, I think, an idea that you and I share, which is treating things a bit like an experiment sometimes, you know, like recognizing that things are going to be messy or imperfect, but not let the perfect be the enemy of the good and really try to advance mm -hmm. ideas, even if the process is messy, as long as we know important components are being brought in that are maybe new and uh, are going to steer us in a direction we need to go. Mm -hmm. So I love the idea of the prosperity package, or I think uh, I've heard of Monty Scott Blackwell, um, a, a comrade that I have continually very much appreciated in my life, uh, both because sometimes we really align on stuff that I think is really cool, and sometimes they challenge the, the hell out of me, and I, I grow from the, <laughs> the um, sometimes very tense interactions we've had about some things. But I've heard Amani advocate for, um, I think like 1% of the general budget being, partic being a participatory budgeting process. Um, and if I'm, thinking correctly about the numbers, that reflects roughly what the prosperity package would be, right? Because um, we're looking at like a 300 plus million dollar general budget and then a three to $4 million prosperity package, right? Yeah, if you're talking about like through like general fund, maybe there's a bunch of other components that we have with other accounts, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be roughly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I'm really glad you brought up what I've often heard referred to as like the tyranny of those who show up. <laughs> or that's not actually exactly how I've heard it, but like um, Occupy dealt with this a lot, right? You have people with great intentions, but it's like who actually has the time to show up to a general assembly every day or once a week, you know? Yeah. And, oh, well, you know, we work with everybody on scheduling, but then you still end up with this majoritarian decision of most people can be here at 6 p.m. Uh, unfortunately, that means that everyone who works service industry can't, mm -hmm. you know, and like, um, any participatory process runs into this problem of how do you involve people in an equitable fashion. And so in my mind, I think one of the most important things we can do when we set up a participatory budgeting process and why I like the prosperity package kind of being the tool for that um, is if we define the goal as equity and the goal is to tackle, um, I think we should be talking about poverty and wealth inequality hand in hand. And I think we should be talking about economic and racial justice hand in hand. And I think we should define those very explicitly in the tasking of that uh, prosperity package, which I think has been done pretty well so far, but has room for improvement. Um, so then the participatory budgeting process that follows would give disproportionate voice to the people who are currently um, disproportionately marginalized. Does that make sense? So like that we that we're that we're finding a way to give extra power to the people who in our current system are under empowered by virtue of lack of wealth um, and lack of access to resources. And so kind of using maybe poverty um, and income and wealth as the, the way we measure that. Um, mm -hmm. And then defining the parameters of what proposals can come forward as having to include like a, like a racial justice component. Right. Or if not, uh, or like at least a, a recognition of the the history of racism and how that relates to why this proposal is good and who it's going mm -hmm. to benefit most. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Yeah, uh, it's kind of like uh, I mean a lot of like the vision committee right now, which I'll say right now I served on for a while, but has has definitely uh, some issues and can be much improved. I'm hoping it does. But one of the things that's built into that is that yeah, like uh, whenever people uh, apply for CDBG funds. Um, if they hit on some of the specific issues that have been pulled out that we want to focus on, and also if they are on specific census tracts where we are really want to target things on that have high high levels of poverty, then like those proposals get like a bonus point and during their evaluation, so that you know they're it's more likely that those ones are going to be at the top of the heap making it through. And yeah, definitely having some kind of process like that and and making sure that we're getting a um, not only a diverse representational 
group that would be involved in something like participatory budgeting. And this is something that I think, again, from organizing, we've, we've both, both experienced, and I think is one of the largest challenges, is that oftentimes you end up relying on the same people in those marginalized groups, um, mm -hmm. which puts a lot of pressure on them, right? And we need to be- And often their labor is done for free, yeah. which perpetuates the problem even further. You know, like who, oh, we want to reach out to people who lack income, so please come to this thing that we're not going to pay you to be at, you know, maybe, yeah. maybe we'll feed you pizza or something, you know, <laughs> and then like, um, right. like it, it, it doesn't really make it uh, an appealing or even pop, like, like, a, like a viable process for a lot of the people who need to be involved. Yeah. And, and so I think, I think we're slowly taking a step away from that and trying to, so like the neighborhood leaders, which is the one thing that was funded out of the particip uh, out of the prosperity package so far. Uh, was this real thing like we created full-time jobs basically as organizers in every one of these elementary school districts and one of the things that I'm hoping comes out of that is not only are those people doing just the work of helping people in their in their area that they're assigned to but also identifying the next batch of community leaders in those neighborhoods so that we end up having a wider pool of people like really engaging on these issues and being involved and then yeah uh, hopefully being actually compensated for that work too, but we're pulling in new people. So, cause if we just keep on relying on the same people, um, yeah, you end up this with burnout. Um, you end up with sometimes a, a, a false sense of representation of a group. Um, and, and so I think that, uh, that is hopefully something that, that we'll see going on. And I, and that's one of the things I am excited about with the resiliency package, uh, for, for COVID-19, um, is us like expanding out the the, the neighbors uh, helping neighbors program, uh, the Athens core, which would be us really like having all these things that a lot of people already do for free, whether it be removing invasive species or people who are out right now like delivering food and picking up food for um, for people who like can't leave their house right now, um, or who are volunteering to distribute food um, instead of having this that be just this free work, we're talking about actually just starting to pay those people, right? A lot of those people are, are out of work, they are normal jobs, and they're doing that work out of the goodness of their heart, helping their community. But yeah, we should be stepping up and making a new model where people actually get paid um, and compensated in and, 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 and a fair way for doing good, extremely valuable work for our community, but value that is not valued necessarily in a capitalistic way, so it's no monetary compensation. And so I'm really excited that for us to be looking at this in a completely new way, in a way I think that we always should have, but now finally are because of this crisis we're in, um, of looking at, you know, what is actually the most valuable thing in our community? Like taking care of each other. Like that is the most valuable thing. And let's make sure that we're actually paying people for it. Um, it, 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 it sucks that it takes a crisis and people dying for us to be able to focus in on that and pay attention to it. But I, I, to me, that's the potential silver lining of this whole issue of us finally starting to do things that we should have been doing a long time ago, which is taking care of the people of our community and moving towards a more equitable community. Yeah, and kind of reverting back to the metaphor I had, like it's a huge part of why I think it's important when we're navigating these stormy seas to have a vision of where we need to go after so that as we get through it, we have in mind like where this needs to take us. Um, it, it can feel gross, I think, to call really challenging and difficult and painful uh, times, like a pandemic. Hey, Sarah. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so, so, so speaking of, and this is just a nice little story, uh, this morning uh, when, when I woke up and got, and got Sarah up this morning. Candy? Candy. We got, we got a bowl of candy here. Nice. And that's because uh, a nice neighbor who lives uh, a couple blocks down the road who hey, has yo, seen you, us. You want candy? Who, I do want candy, yeah. Who saw us like playing in the front yard and talked to us. Uh, they knew we had a young, uh, you know, we had Sarah here, a three-year-old. She just had her birthday last week. Um, and they came in, the, I guess, in the early morning or in the middle of the night, I don't know, and put Easter eggs all over our front yard so that she could Aww. be excited and, and run around and find Easter eggs. So we spent nice. the morning getting Easter egg hunts and she has a giant bowl of candy now. Um, wow. Heck yeah. Way more candy than she needs. Can I have an airhead? Can I have this one? I love, you've got, you've got Sarah and Mariah had eggs the cat. <laughs> really, and Erin had cricket the cat. There's really been just like amazing, adorable 
uh, small creatures that have uh, entered these kitchen table chats. Yeah, and a, a behind the scenes thing, one of the uh, executive sessions that we've had at uh, the mayor commission, um, where after we had to cut off the thing to talk about like legal issues or, or, or land purchase and stuff, um, it had been a long night. So all of us kind of got our animals and just like held our animals during that part of the session. So I was holding my cat Rilke, Mariah had her cat, um, Melissa had her dog, Russell had his dog. We were all just kind of like hanging out, talking to lawyers on this thing and just, yeah coping with our with our little animals so well uh oh anna swain sauce anna swain oh wow anna hi hey, anna. anna says teams are ducking all the way hi yeah. hooligans hey anna so i've been re recognizing the value in uh deliberate choice of wardrobe and uh not wearing a suit or a tie uh <laughs> perhaps a very formal skirt though very excited about that uh but uh this, you know, before we were ever doing politics, before uh, Jenny, your spouse at the time, uh, a mere partner status, uh, mm -hmm. uh, designed the logo for our softball team, the Turduckins, yeah. with our very famous slogan, Go Turds. Um, um, so <laughs> we... uh, and note, note the teal. I do wonder how much the teal of our Turduckins t-shirts relates to why Athens for Everyone and so many of our campaigns since have this deal involved it's definitely been a color i've always loved actually my uh yeah my my telecaster although it's sun hitting it's a little hard but that's basically the color of my telecaster i've been playing since like 2000 also it's a uh, definitely a color that it's a it's a nice color right it's soothing but it's i don't know yeah everybody likes well, that greens you know. blues and, and yellows are my fave yeah, but yeah, Turduckins. What, did we did we win it? Did we win one game or zero games? One game. We almost game. had a fully defeated season, and then mm -hmm. we beat a team in this kind of dramatic victory. Oh, uh, and right. and then we almost won a second game, but we had yeah, that almost. mighty Casey situation where our best yeah. hitter struck out with the bases yeah. loaded. Yeah. <laughs> uh, or not struck out. Hit this like piddling grounder. Um, like the, the mightiest swing for the dinkiest dribble of a hit. Um, but yeah, we had the one the one victory and we all gathered around home plate and, and she right. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I did have one other thing I wanted to talk about before we go, if that's cool. Okay. Uh, and it's, I, I, I only skimmed a post that I saw right before we got on here from Joey Carter um, about unions and union support and supporting organized labor and it seemed like it might've been a bit of a call out post. I don't know, I have to read it in more detail. Um, but I did see that Joey had said, you know, all these people are running for commission. I've only heard one of them uh, work. I've only seen one of them work with organized labor to date. Um, I actually don't know if Joey's referring to me as that person or not, uh, but certainly I haven't, as uh, he mentioned in that post, uh, reached out to the union for an endorsement yet. Um, by some combination of uh, being overwhelmed by all the things to try to do with this campaign. And uh, also, uh, last I had talked to some folks in the union, my understanding was that uh, UCWGA was not doing endorsements. So I was uh, curious if that's changed and also definitely want to make clear how very pro-union I am and how interested I am in talking with more union organizers other than yourself, but you as somebody who works for the union, uh, if you wanted to take a minute to maybe talk about that. And certainly um, if there's some things that need to be clarified about uh, things I've missed that I need to be doing or ways I can better engage with y'all in the work you're doing, I would, I would love to understand that better now and uh, speak to whatever you might be aware of that folks in the union wanna see from people like me who are running. Uh, yeah, that uh, happy to. And so um, just the point, yeah, I'm one of the, the organizers there. I'm also a um, solidarity member. Um, I don't work for the, the university, uh, but I still uh, pay my dues because I want to see that union succeed. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, the, uh, I've been working with them now for a couple of years. It's kind of, yeah, it's kind of basically, yeah, yeah, since, since, uh, starting to run for uh, the commission. And so yeah, it's been a couple of years now. And uh, the union, uh, United Campus Workers of Georgia has grown immensely, not only in its numbers, uh, having members all over the state um, at, at, at nearly a dozen institutions, 
but also just in its, uh, in its power and its capacity. It's been very exciting. Uh, some of the groups I've worked with has been like the graduate students committee and also working with some of the, um, uh, uh, was it, uh, um, some of the instructors and stuff they've been working, but uh, they've really realized their own power and become this empowered group of workers, which is what we want to see, right? Across, not just here in Athens and Georgia, but across the United States and the world um, who, who do not uh, at all take their power for granted and, and definitely try to use it in a way in solidarity to speak uh, to their employer, which is the University System of Georgia, um, and to make demands, which em employees should be able to. Employees should be able to demand to have uh, decent wages and decent benefits and to work in a, in a place that they feel comfortable and safe in and, uh, and, and to have a, a, a communication about those, how that works and actually have a say. Um, and so I think UCWGA has been a, a fantastic example of how um, unions can work in Georgia, even though we're a right to work state, there's, there's a lot of confusion around that. And then UCWGA has just moved forward to no, we, we do have power, we have power in numbers, and, and have moved forward that way and have had some real victories and stuff too recently, again, especially around uh, graduate, graduate workers, and also in some of the demands during this pandemic crisis um, for um, for pay for, for employees. And uh, when it comes to the, the commission and commission candidates, I think uh, doing more there. And I think maybe just like, uh, you know, supporting some of their calls of action that they're doing right now that, that have been going out, especially during this crisis. One of the ones is trying to make sure that people who are essential employees are paid hazard pay, had paid, uh, paid double time. And I think that is definitely something they deserve. If we're going to be putting people in a situation where we know it is dangerous for them, we know it, right? That's why we sent all the other workers away. We know it's dangerous. And so therefore, it, yeah, we should, like, they, we should make them make it up for them. And first off, making sure that they have enough PPP and they're protected, but also make sure that they're being compensated at a rate that is actually the value of the work they're doing, which is much higher than their normal pay. Um, so I think having uh, candidates such as yourself supporting those calls and, um, and, and getting those uh, social media feeds going around so it spreads the word of what they're doing. And definitely going, they are now uh, creating a, a way they can do endorsements on local level uh, uh, races on higher level that is handled up higher up by CWA because um, we're underneath the Communication Workers of America. Um, but on that's being working. We're actually creating now here in Athens because it's the the largest presence of our members, and it's kind of where the union started. Our own leadership center here in Athens uh, under UGA, and so we're at, we actually have like this 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 little uh, leadership structure just based here in Athens that kind of work on those decisions along with the entire membership. Um, and I think another thing is is just being um, continuing to be creative and supportive when it comes to um, labor policy. Um, I can definitely speak that it's it's challenging to do so on a local level, on a local governing level, when you have a state government that puts so many restrictions in place about what you can do, especially when it comes to wages um, and um, employee contracts, those kind of things. But just continuing to be uh, supportive and, and, and creative with ways that we could be supporting our workers more. Um, I mean, one of the things that I've been working on and grappling with and continue to work, work on is just getting athens Clark County employees unionized, you know, I've been encouraging that but trying to find ways that I can help facilitate that more. Um, I want our workers to know that they are uh, welcome and encouraged to join unions, and that I feel that they are, um, that it will make them uh, better workers and it'll make us a better county um, by having that too. Uh, but it is a challenge to find ways to, to, to actually enact that policy, but it's why we have to be creative. Um, like you said, have those bold ideas out there, put them up on our whiteboard. I got my, I got my whiteboard up here, put them up on our whiteboard, have them up there at all times and just be thinking about what we can do to try to uh, make those things reality. Well, sometimes like maybe I think certain things go without saying, but to make clear, um, I'm on board with all of that and have spent a fair amount of time, you know, I think, as you know, so this feels a little bit performative to be saying this to you, uh, but because there's an audience here that I hope uh, uh, includes members of the union. Um, I've been very supportive of unions all along. I have been to a number of the um, UCWGA stuff, especially in the early stages when those folks were coming down from Tennessee and things. 
Um, I was really excited about a lot of what was happening when it was getting organized. Um, and uh, back when the Coalition of Immokalee Workers came here um, during the Boycott Wendy's um, protest, and we, you know, I was basically, I mean, again, I, I've hated all along trying to take credit for this stuff, but I can say, honestly, I was like the lead organizer for Athens for Everyone in, in trying to facilitate that day of action, which included like the march that started at Daily Co-op and went past mm -hmm. Wendy's and, and downtown and back. And then the, the movie that we had at Cine. And it was this collaboration between um, a bunch of organizations in town to try to build worker solidarity um, with the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, but also to advance the cause of workers' rights here. Um, I was one of the folks in Athens for Everyone that helped organize the workers' coffee hours with attorney John Beasley, who's a really wonderful mm -hmm. labor lawyer. Yep. He came to us early on and said that he wanted to host these and would we be willing. And it was uh, essentially Drew Hooks and I that were like, Drew's moved to Mexico now, but uh, that, were, that were organizing those. And um, so I'm all about finding ways to do that more over time. And certainly... Um, anyone, sorry, this, I can see the sun is both hitting me on the side of my eye and you know, it moves over time, the sun. Um, uh, and if there's, there's things that I can be doing more as a candidate, um, you know, another thing is the, the conversation about a worker center, I've heard go a lot of ways. And the way I've talked about that has been kind of heavily influenced by a conversation you and I had about what role the government should take in um, like helping establish a worker center and whether it makes sense for the government to be hosting a space versus like uh, other policies or investment that the government can make. And I've kind of pivoted towards seeing the economic development department as uh, a, a, a place to leverage influence um, where the businesses we're recruiting or that we might provide free services to are ones that are that take on a, a set of beliefs, including being um, explicitly open to or pro-union, uh, as well as I, I like the idea of worker cooperatives. I worked a lot with Matthew Epperson and the, the Georgia Cooperative Center and stuff. So, um, and, and just workers' rights in general, there's a lot of room for HR policies to be built on a business by business level, be they nonprofit or for-profit or the government or the university. Um, yeah. Uh, there, there's room for HR policies to exceed what's legally mandated, but it's still legal to pass. For example, like a just cause clause that doesn't allow you to fire people. You know, we're an at will state. So right now everyone's accustomed right. to signing these things, but employers can opt into um, a, a policy of their own where they won't fire someone without just cause. Um, we need stronger anti-discrimination legislation. It's actually one of the things I, I wish had already been accomplished by the local government, because I know you're one of a majority of people who said that we should have it, so I wish we would, uh, it's, but it's, definitely it's continue to committee. keep fighting for it. It's in it's committee, in finally. In, well, it is cool. in committee, but uh, so we got, uh, actually, uh, um, I've been working with uh, Kathy Woolard, former Atlanta City Council person, um, who actually wrote the Atlanta one many, many years ago, and um, they now work with um, Georgia Equality, so I've been working with, the, with Kathy to basically go through all the other ones that already exist here and try to find what would be the best one fit here in Athens. Mm -hmm. And we were able to have a meeting uh, with Kathy, with Mayor Gertz, uh, with our county attorneys, and also, uh, and, and, and uh, Mariah, Commissioner Parker uh, was there too. And we kind of worked and got, went through all of those and found the one that works, we believe, best for, um, for athens Clark County. And that has been assigned to uh, the Legislative Review Committee. That was assigned basically the voting meeting before all of this happened. Um, and so now it's, uh, so it's sitting there, but unfortunately those, those committee meetings have been canceled right now. If this continues on much longer, we're going to have to start having video ones for it. Um, but it is, um, I am, I am very hopeful that we will have, um, and I will work tirelessly to ensure that we will have a anti-discrimination ordinance on the books here in athens Clark County by the end of the year. Well, heck yeah. And if for some reason it doesn't happen by then, I really hope to be there to help it push, help okay. you push it over the edge in 2021. Yeah, definitely. definitely. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, in, you know, you might recall this uh, conversation goes back at least for us personally to when Mocha and Noah Johnson approached Athens for Everyone um, in the wake of that, you know, awful margarita shot that uh, the, the still existing very racist bar on Clayton Street um, had. 
And uh, and the start of those discrimination marches, you know, we we had some demands um, from which the amendment to the alcohol ordinance came, but was really just a crumb and, and not the cake that we need. Yep. Uh, and so uh, we still need that anti-discrimination legislation. I'm really excited to hear that it is filing committee, but I've been strong proponent of that all along. And actually, um, if, if you are open to sharing whatever documents y'all have about what that law is looking like right now, I'd love to see it. I'm sure many others would too, um, but uh, certainly, at whatever point I am able, I would like to help push for that policy to be as strong as possible. Um, is that something that, like, do you have a draft that you can share? Um, we do. I, I can. I can at least share the the one that we're modeling over, uh, okay. which is the uh, the Brookhaven uh, ordinance that was passed okay. just uh, three, maybe four months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's the one that we're we're using as a draft, at least to create our own. Um, like I said, it's definitely going to have some changes. I'm sure put into it as it goes through committee. And then of course, it'll have does to come it, before the entire commission to vote on. Does it apply to education, housing, workplace, and public accommodations? It does. Yes. Yeah. Because that's the, the key thing, right? I mean, it's like all we got with the alcohol ordinance was the public accommodations component. And well, only, for only, certain, only for certain businesses with certain alcohol, alcohol licenses and only surrounding a couple of scenarios, not even it was. I, I call that the bar admittance ordinance. When I talk yeah. about it, I called the bar yeah. mentor because that's what it is. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear that that's happening. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, do you know where, uh, I don't know if you know the, the post I'm referring to, but when Joey was posting about that, are there, is there frustration within the union of, of like a lack of engagement from candidates and, and commissioners or. Um, I, I don't, I don't know that there, I can't necessarily, uh, I definitely can't like speak for the union as just being uh, just one of the ordinances that works for them. Uh, I think there's there's a uh, there definitely is a wanting of of uh, figuring out and testing some of the the political capital and the political power that's been built up in the union. I think there's definitely some individuals who really and 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 I agree with them that they should um, who want to uh, to use that and to really figure out what that looks like and and um, that these local races are are a great opportunity to do so. Um, I, I believe Joey is correct, as far as I know, of uh, no commission, uh, commissioner, um, commissioners or uh, candidates requesting an endorsement. Um, I believe that um, Deborah Gonzalez in, uh, requested uh, an endorsement a while back. And of course, that whole race is in a, a weird limbo, which I hope gets fixed very soon. Um, but yeah, I uh, definitely would encourage uh, you to reach out to the union um, to to uh, to get engaged uh, with them on that level. Yeah. Well, heck yeah. Well, I know we're we're very deep into this chat, but if anybody else is watching and wants to as well, please, I would encourage everyone to seek that out. Uh, certainly, I will be doing so. Quite literally, the only reason I haven't is because when I asked a couple folks in the union, granted it's been a few months, but last I heard. Uh, there were discussions about potentially trying to do endorsements, but there was kind of strong debate about whether to or not. And at, and at that time, at least there weren't any, um, yeah, the, the decision was to not. So, so I'm actually, I'm really glad to hear that they're, that they're yeah, doing it now. And I hope that it does. Yeah. yeah. I hope that it does expand. Um, cool. Well, do you have any, uh, parting, parting thoughts, wisdoms, questions, critiques, enthusiasms, uh, dreams? No, I, I I'm glad I'm glad this I'm glad this is happening. This is nice. It's been nice to sit down and, and, and talk with you, like you said, like uh, uh, especially during these times. It's you know you don't get the this is as close to face to face as we get, and uh, why not awkwardly have uh, an hour and a half conversation of you and I broadcasted for everyone to watch oh, on the yeah, internet, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. Uh, I mean, th these conversations usually would happen somehow, like uh, you know, in our kitchen or something at like twelve thirty at night, and why didn't we ever think about recording those before and putting them up on the internet? <laughs> yeah, it's simultaneously like weird. It's been really weird for me personally to like be doing this uh, in part because uh, I think it's just weird to be like watched, but also, and, and I, you know, I have this aversion to being on screens, um, but there's also this way that it feels almost like arrogant, you know, to be like, who wants to listen to me? But that's... <laughs> Uh, by by virtue of being on the commission and and myself by virtue of running to be on the commission, we've clearly chosen to put ourselves in a position where people 
ought to want to hear what we want to say. So thanks for sure. for doing this with me. It's sure. been uh, happy it's been to. really cool to uh, yeah, it's been fun. All right, well, yeah. stay uh stay healthy, stay safe. Yeah, and uh, enjoy puzzling. Yeah. I saw Jenny's post about puzzles. I wish I could be doing a puzzle with you. All. She finished. She finished one last night, and I think they're gonna start a new one today. So get, we have a. What's it called? The uh, the great puzzle company, whatever it is. Uh, do it. Do a plug. Um, who has all local artists? They have. They have puzzle. Yeah, the very good puzzle dot com. Oh, oh, very good puzzle. Yeah, I have one of their Eleanor Davis puzzles. Yep, we have a couple yeah. Eleanor Davis. The one we finished uh, last night was a David Hale design. Beautiful. Uh, I think it's called the River Keepers, and uh, yeah. we get to we'll break out another one too. So if people are are bored, which all of us are experiencing that a little bit go to verygoodpuzzle.com and buy a puzzle from a local Athens artist. And then part of that money goes to some of the nonprofits who are doing great work here. So, yeah. Heck yeah. All right. Well, on that plug, I have to wait for you to end the, the thing. Okay. Do it. Yeah, you have the power, Woo. Commissioner Denson. Woo. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for listening and participating in the chats. And, oh, I should say uh, the next one is scheduled TBD. But as you and Sean used to like to joke about Hool's rules, um, among the rules I have for this uh, is uh, I'm not having them at set days and times because I am reluctant to commit to a set schedule, especially in these crazy times. And I'm not going to talk to two white dudes in a row. So I'm not sure who yet of the people I've asked will be in the next one. Um, but uh, it will it will not be another another white dude until uh, I at least talk to somebody who's who's not. Although you're actually the first white dude to do this with me, so thanks for representing the thus far underrepresented white dudes in kitchen table chats. Not sure how I feel about that, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thanks, bud. See you Bye. next time. Love you.